thank you very much everybody for joining us this evening and welcome to this webinar on improving inhaler technique community improving inhaler technique through community pharmacy apologies my name is Alison Scowcroft um, and I work for CHL a pharmacy provider company for Greater Manchester and I'm joined this evening by my colleagues Louise Gatley and Peter Marks who also work for CHL um, alongside other roles they have uh, with Bolton and GML PCs in Greater Manchester just a little note about the Greater Manchester Healthcare Academy who are hosting this webinar this evening. Um, it's a partnership between the NHS Community Pharmacy um, in Greater Manchester supported by key education and training providers and the focus is engaging and supporting community pharmacies to achieve their full potential in service delivery. There's a wide range of training run by the Greater Manchester Healthcare Academy and we do support the whole pharmacy team. In terms of service delivery in Greater Manchester, um, we're in a, an exciting new time with regards to services in Greater Manchester. GPCPCS is the service on everybody's lips along with DMS and both are um, being implemented across Greater Manchester. So for those services as well as um, the reason we're here this evening, which is the Inhaler Technique Service, it's really important that those pharmacies who are Commission to deliver those services do step up and embrace the opportunity. We need to deliver what we promise. We need to deliver some activity through the inhaler technique service. Um, and it's really important so that we can demonstrate to uh, Greater Manchester NHS system um, and to GPs that community pharmacy has a really important role to play with regards to supporting people with asthma and COPD with using their inhalers. So hopefully this webinar will give you a little bit more information and knowledge to help you with delivering this service to a really high standard. Um, obviously we're not in Teams, we're in Zoom, but just to note that everybody is on mute um, through the Zoom webinar functionality. We have got some questions that we're gonna ask later on and we're gonna do those in the form of a poll. So a pop-up menu will open up on your screen and you'll be asked to answer some questions. I'll tell you about that in a little while. If you do have any other questions, you can put those into the chat box and myself and my colleagues will try and answer those as we're going along. And we do have a Q&A session at the end and we'll pick out any questions from that uh, chat box in that session that we think are really helpful to discuss in a little bit more detail on the screen. So the agenda for tonight and um, this evening, I'm going to talk about the um, an overview of the Inhaler Technic service, what's new for this year. Some of you may have provided this service before in the past, so I'm going to highlight some of the changes, talk a little bit about how your team can support and um, talk about the ACT and the CAT scores. I'll give you a very quick overview of the farm outcomes modules and then we've got some resources pages. Then I'll hand over to Peter, who's going to do a virtual workshop session with you. So he's got an array of inhaler devices in front of him on the table, and he's going to talk you through using a lot of those devices. We're going to highlight which are the common devices that are used in Greater Manchester. Um, and Peter will also talk about the in-check device. And then Peter will hand over to Louise, who's going to talk to you about uh, delivery support. So we do have some key performance indicators for the service. Um, and Lou will talk about some barriers and challenges and, and, and hopefully help you to overcome some of those. And then we'll have questions at the end. So um, I'm just going to say a brief word um, of thanks for our sponsors for this evening. You can see them listed on the screen there. We do have some slides from some of these sponsors um, which have, are being shown to you as part of the sponsorship agreement. So I'm just going to whiz through those sponsor slides shortly. Uh, the GSK one comes a little bit further down in the presentation. So I'll just leave these slides on screen just for a second um, to thank our sponsors. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay. So moving on to the content of the webinar for this evening, we've got some objectives listed on screen for you. Hopefully by the end of the session, you should be familiar with the training requirements and understand what preparation you need to do in your pharmacy before you start to recruit patients into the service. Um, review how you deliver a consultation with a patient and understand the use of the ACT and the CAT score as well as the in-check device. We also want you to become familiar with demonstrating correct inhaler technique and obviously you're going to need to do some practice on that um, uh, at home or in the pharmacy um, we'll talk through the KPIs so you'll be able to understand what they are and also receive some advice on how to deliver the service in your pharmacy. So as I mentioned earlier, we do have a quiz. Um, they're not going to be in the chat box. Apologies, I need to update this slide. We're going to do them in a form of a poll on the, the Zoom webinar. So um, we've got five questions for you and we have up for grabs. Please don't get too excited about this, but actually it is very exciting. The five people who get the most correct answers um, selected at random, if there are more than five people, will receive a free in-check device posted directly to their pharmacy for use in delivering this service. So thank you very much to Clement Clark, who make the in-check device um, for giving us some prizes. So watch out for the quiz questions. You'll see this orange question mark box appear and then the poll will pop up on your screen. So watch out for those quiz questions as we go through the evening's webinar. Okay, so I'm just gonna give you a little bit of an overview of the service. And we're going to start off with one of those quiz questions that I just talked to you about. So hopefully I can make this work and you should be able to see. So the first question is um, actually a very sad uh, fact to discuss in a webinar, unfortunately, but it really just shows you the size of the potential impact that we can have in this service. And that is in 2017, how many people died from asthma? in the UK. You can see some numbers coming through here. Um, you've got a lot of choices there. We've given you 10 numbers to choose from varying between 53 and 2,564. So lots of numbers there to choose from. I can see lots of answers coming in. Thank you very much. We've not had anybody up for 53 as yet, which is the lowest option, but I can see the answers are coming in thick and fast for some of those higher numbers. So in 2017, how many people in the UK died from asthma, which let's remember is an entirely reversible condition? Just give you another minute or two to answer that question. Don't forget there is five in-check uh, in devices up for grabs for the people who are most successful with these five quiz questions. So um, if everybody can pop their answers, into the poll, we would really appreciate it, please. Just gonna give you another couple of seconds and then we're gonna move on. Okay, I am gonna close the poll. So the answer to that question was, actually most people got the right answer. Well done, 30% of you got the right answer there. The answer was 1,484. So 17 people got that right, well done. Okay, so the service specification has been updated in 2021. The Inhaler Technique Service was originally commissioned um, a long time ago, I think it was 2013, 2014, and it's been through a variety of different iterations in that time. It's commissioned at Greater Manchester level by uh, the NHS in Greater Manchester. And CHL um, took over responsibility for managing the service a couple of years ago in 2018. We did some um, support for pharmacies who were providing the service at that time and got some feedback um, from pharmacies um, around some barriers that they had to service delivery. Um, and so we worked closely with um, the Greater Manchester Health and Social Care Partnership at the time, um, NHS and Greater Manchester to um, try and change the service specification slightly to address some of those uh, barriers to service provision. So we've worked really closely um, at CHL with Bolton and GMLPCs to negotiate um, the specification update for 2021. So previously, only pharmacists could deliver the service. Um, now, uh, pharmacy technicians are also able to deliver, so that's fantastic. 
Um, there's also the removal of the requirement to complete five consultations in full. So previously, the, um, con the, the, the fees were only released once you'd completed five full consultations. Um, so that restriction has now been removed. We're also um, able to deliver consultations remotely. So that's another uh, benefit. Previously, you could only do that with commissioner's consent. And we have negotiated a, um, a five pounds incentive for a positive change in CAT or ACT score. So if you do an in initial consultation and a follow up consultation with the patient, if it's clinically appropriate and the CAT or ACT score improves, then you will get an additional five pounds incentive payment, which we think is a, a, a really good a benefit also, apologies. So the activity fees, um, 10 pounds for the initial consultation as before with, oops, sorry, seven pounds for the follow-up consultation. Um, no payment will be made um, if the information hasn't been recorded on farm outcomes. Um, and as I mentioned before, you'll get that five pound for a positive change in ACT or CAT score. So um, farm outcomes is used to generate invoices for the payment. Um, and everything that you do, your consultation is all recorded in farm outcomes um, and payments will be made uh, by BAX by CHL. So hopefully we've uh, already got all your details to allow that payment to be made. In terms of the training requirements, um, it, it has become a little bit more complicated. So I'm just going to go through these in a little bit more detail. So if you are a pharmacist who has previously delivered the service, then you must check your declaration of competence on the CPP website and make sure that it's within three years. If not, you'll need to renew that. And you'll also need to attend a service delivery webinar, which is this webinar um, once every three years. If you're a pharmacist that's new to delivering the service, then same again for the CPP declaration of competence. Um, and also uh, you'll need to attend this webinar when available, but pharmacists can start to deliver the service before attending a webinar as long as they've completed their declaration of competence. If you are a pharmacy technician, um, you won't have delivered the service directly before. So again, you'll need to complete the declaration of competence on CPPE and any associated learning, um, attend the service delivery webinar, which is this one, and also just have a chat with um, your pharmacist to make sure that you feel competent and confident in delivering the service prior to commencing. Okay, just a quick note about remote consultations. So they are allowed in the service specification now, as I mentioned earlier. Um, just highlight some a couple of resources for you. Um, CPPE have a gateway page on remote consultations. Um, which would be really helpful for you to have a look through um, before trying to uh, set up any remote consultations. And there's also um, a video conferencing page on PSNC's website, which gives you a bit more information and a list of approved systems. But really what we want you to think about if you're going to deliver consultations remotely is to make sure that you can meet the requirements in the service specification. So you need to think about how you're going to demonstrate inhaler technique appropriately. Um, and how you're going to review a patient's inhaler technique if you're delivering this consultation remotely. So I think um, it's fair to say when I've discussed with colleagues, with, with Peter and Louise, we do feel that if you're going to deliver this consultation appropriately, it would need to be a, a video conferencing uh, solution and, and not a telephone consultation, just so that you can make sure that you deliver those requirements of the service spec. Okay, so... Um, there's lots of opportunities for the whole of the pharmacy team to support um, the pharmacist or technician has to complete the consultation with the patient um, in the bottom two boxes for, for the initial and the follow up. But actually anybody within the pharmacy team can recruit patients for you. So the eligibility criteria is any patient who uses inhalers um, and has a diagnosis of asthma or COPD and is registered with a Manchester, uh, sorry, a Greater Manchester GP. So your team can, can recruit patients for you. Um, you can print out your CAT and ACT score questions and your team can um, ask patients to complete those and have those ready. For, for when the consultation starts. And you can also get your team to support with making appointments and um, phoning people up to make sure they remember they've got an appointment tomorrow or chasing people up who don't turn up for appointments. So please do involve your team. This is not just for the pharmacist 
or the technician to deliver. It is for, for everybody in the pharmacy team to support with. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the asthma control test now or the ACT score. Um, there's five questions and Farm Outcomes is, is set up really, really nicely that you just click on the little calculator at the side of the question and it opens a pop-up window with the questions in and there's a sliding scale of answers for each question. So you'll ask the patient each question, one to five, where answering one is all the time and answering five is none of the time. And this asks about their asthma symptoms over the last four weeks. So it's a very subjective score, um, but it gives you an indication of how well the patient's asthma is being controlled. Um, anybody who scores 25, um, uh, well done. Their asthma is, uh, is, it has been under control in the last four weeks. Um, anybody who's 20 to 24, they're on target. So their asthma may be reasonably well controlled, but actually there is a little bit of room for improvement. Um, and anybody who's scoring less than 20, then they are definitely off target. There's in high indications that their asthma has not been controlled during the past four weeks um, and certainly could benefit from, from some advice in terms of how to improve their asthma control. So for a ACT at score, a high score is good and a low score is bad. So I'm going to move on to COPD now and we have another quiz question. So let's see if I can get this quiz question up for you. So the question is the national COPD prevalence in Greater Manchester, in the UK, sorry. I'll get this in a second. There we go. Hopefully you've got that. The COPD prevalence in England is 2%. What is the prevalence of COPD in Greater Manchester? So you've got a, a big long list of options there again. We don't want to make it too easy for you. And um, we want to try and uh, make it as difficult as possible, give you a bit of a test. You can see all the high options there people are going for at the moment. So nobody thinks that the COPD prevalence is 0.46%. So not going to give you any tips as to whether that's the right answer or not. Um, but I can see lots of answers coming through. Thank you. I can see everybody's interacting well with this. So the favourite at the moment seems to be 2.27%. That's what everybody seems to be saying, um, uh, closely followed by 3.4%. That's the next most common answer. So 2% uh, national COPD prevalence. What is the prevalence in Greater Manchester? Just give you another minute or two to get those answers through, and then I'll close the poll and tell you the answer. Thank you for your interaction with, this, uh, with this, these quiz questions. Hopefully you're finding it interesting and stimulating. Okay, a few more people have voted in this one. Excellent, thank you. I can see we've got 63 of 76 attendees have voted. So we're nearly on 100% uh, nearly on there voting. Just give you another couple of seconds just to put your answers in before I close the poll. Okay, I've closed that one down now. So the most popular answer was 2.27%. But I can tell you that surprisingly enough, and this certainly surprised me, the correct answer was 1.92%. So in Greater Manchester, our prevalence is slightly less than the national average, which I think is surprising. But we did have eight people got that answer right, so well done. So now we're talking about COPD, then we'll talk about the COPD assessment questions. So this one's a little bit more involved. There's eight questions here rather than five as there was with the ACT. And these eight questions ask the patient um, about the impact of their COPD on their quality of life. So again, it's built into farm outcomes. You press the little calculator and the questions open up. And this one is a sliding scale where you're asking the patient to score the impact on their quality of life for each question between naught and five. So this one, the scoring is the opposite way around to the ACT, which I always find a little bit confusing. You've got to try and remember it. So in the CAT score, um, a score of five or less is a good score. So that in, suggests that their COPD is, um, is, is having a minimal impact on their quality of life. As we get higher, then you can see the higher the score, the higher the score, the higher their impact of their COPD. So anybody who's got a score over 30, 
the COPD has a very high impact on their quality of life. It stops them doing pretty much everything they want to do and they never have good days. So there's some significant room for improvement there. Anybody over 20, um, their COPD has a high impact on their quality of life. It's stopping them doing most things that they want to do. Um, so again, significant room for improvement. 10 to 20 is a medium impact um, and there's still room for improvement there. Um, and anything under 10, really, most days are good for that patient, but COPD does cause them a few problems. So CAT and ACT are two really good um, tests that we have that will help measure the quality of the patient's life and um, uh, the impact of, of their condition on the quality of life. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, there is an incentive if you can demonstrate a positive impact in CAT. So for CAT, it would be the score goes down from initial consultation to follow up. And for ACT, the score would go up for a positive impact. Just a quick uh, note around the roles and responsibilities of the pharmacy and the team in delivering this service. Um, you must make sure that there's enough accredited pharmacists and technicians and trained pharmacy staff available to provide the service before you enrol a patient. Um, if you can't provide the service at that time, then the patient should be directed to the nearest pharmacy who can provide that service. And you must inform the commissioner if they're unable to provide the service for an extended period of time, which is defined as four weeks or more. You are also, as a pharmacy team, responsible for sourcing the equipment to deliver the service. So in check device, placebo inhalers, etc. Um, we've got lots of supporting information for you around that. Um, we have pulled together a list of how you can access placebo devices, um, which is on the CHL website. We'll share the links later. Okay, question number three. For somebody who has um, an MDI and they have a good inhaler technique, what percentage of drug reaches the lungs? So somebody using an MDI, a metered dose in, uh, inhaler, monitored dose inhaler, and they've got a good technique, what percentage of drug reaches that patient's lungs? You can see the options vary from very low at 10 to 30 percent up to 80 to 100 percent so what percentage of drug reaches the lungs if you've got a good inhaler technique with an mdi okay i can see the answers coming in thick and fast again thank you very much for interacting the favorite at the moment seems to be 60 to 80 percent so that's what, uh, that's what most people are thinking at the moment. Oh, I can see that uh, 20 to 40% is actually just taken over as the favorite response. And I can see that a lot of you have already voted now. So uh, I'll just give you another minute or two before I close the poll. So what percentage of drug reaches the lungs if you've got a good inhaler technique for MDIs? Just give it another second or two for any more answers that might come through ranging from 10 to 30% up to 80 to 100%. Okay, I'm gonna close the poll there, thank you. The favorite answer by far was 20 to 40%, and that is the correct answer, so well done. Um, actually shockingly low, isn't it? So even if you really know how to use your MDI well, you're still getting less than half of the drug that um, is, ex is actually delivered, so really um really a difficult device to use for a lot of people so we'll just do a little quick overview now of farm outcomes which is um everybody's familiar with i'm sure for recording service provision and um, because we've got a new set of farm outcomes modules for the new service we do need you to enroll again even if you were previously providing the service um, the enrolment looks up to your declaration of competence on CPPE, so you will need to make sure that, that is the permissions are set properly on your CPPE profile to allow the declaration of competence to pull through to farm outcomes. And you just have to confirm that you've read the spec and that you have appropriate um, insurance in place to cover you for the service. The initial consultation is very similar to the previous version of this service, so you must get consent from the patient um, to share information with their GP if, if appropriate and collect their um, obviously you collect their demographic information record the consultation and then the diagnosis is a drop down box as is smoking st status 
Once you've selected the diagnosis, um, it will come up with either ACT or CAT score, depending on which diagnosis you've selected. And then there's a few questions there just to identify the patient's current care. We've got links to Asthma UK and British Lung Foundation there as well for you. So as I mentioned, ACT or CAT score appears um, dependent upon the diagnosis that you've selected. And then there's links for both for more information on interpreting those scores if you feel that that's, that's required. Then you'll go through each of the inhalers that the patient is prescribed um, using the drop down list to pick the inhaler and you can add in up to four inhalers. You will um, observe the patient's technique um, you will then, um, if appropriate, and if the pharmacy, um, if the consultation is taking place in the pharmacy, you may decide to use the in-check, which Peter will talk about later, to identify whether that inhaler device is appropriate for that patient. Um, you then may need to demonstrate the correct technique to the patient um, and then potentially ask them to repeat that back to you. And then you can record any issues that might have been identified any actions that you needed to take and whether the final observed technique is good. And you will run through those questions for each inhaler that the patient is using. You'll then be asked to decide whether you need to follow up with that patient. So um, we would only ask you to follow up if it's clinically appropriate. So if, for example, you've had to give the patient some advice on how to use their inhalers, if their inhalers, and that would be a, um, an appropriate reason to follow up to make sure that when they come back to you in, in eight to 12 weeks, that that, that that new inhaler technique that you've demonstrated to them has stuck with them. You can also um, request some action from the GP. So Farm Outcomes will generate a notification, which goes through by email to the GP if their email address is set up with Farm Outcomes. Um, and please make sure that if you do make any recommendations to the GP, um, you put something clear and concise in the reason for referral box and that exact wording will go through to the GP. You can then arrange the date and time of the appointment for the follow-up consultation with the patient and then there's a free type box at the end for any notes you want to add. In terms of the follow-up then, which is eight to 12 weeks later, um, information again is very similar. So you go through most of the same questions, just asking whether there's been any changes since the initial consultation to their current care. You'll do the ACT and CAT again. And as I said, it's really important at the follow-up consultation that you do do that score again, because we really want to see a positive change in ACT or CAT score. And then you'll run through each of the halos as prescribed again, very much the same as you did in the initial consultation, just to make sure that that um, inhaler technique is appropriate. At the follow up, um, you may again decide that action by the GP is required and the notification will be set up and sent through farm outcomes as in the previous module. We've got some resources for you um, to support with delivering the service. These are available on the CHL website and also your LPC website, be that Bolton or Greater Manchester. And we've got some links um, in the slides here. We will make these available to you afterwards. Um, a few more really good links there. So I'm now going to hand over to Peter. And um, Peter's going to talk through some of the devices and do some demonstrations for you. So, um, Peter, I'll just go through the first three sl a few slides and then we'll stop sharing the screen, yeah? Thank you. So, question four, and it's all down to me. Welcome everyone for a start. So, I've got quite a few inhalers on the table in front of me, but how many inhalers do you think that are available on the market in the UK? So we've got a great range of numbers there between 47 and 203. Alison can see the, see the responses. I actually can't see the live responses. Uh, so if Alison will just talk through the responses for me, please. I will. So let's have a see. Yep, the votes are coming in. Thank you, Peter. Um, we oh, it's it's um, people can't decide on this one. It's very evenly <laughs> split between about four or five different numbers. Um, we've got a few people who've gone for for the lowest, forty-seven. We've got a few people who've gone for the highest at two hundred three, and then it's probably a standard distribution bell curve. Actually, looking at the uh, looking at the numbers, so is it like ask the audience and who wants to be a millionaire when you get that terrible one which has got four even answers? and yes. not got a clue. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. So a really widespread of answers actually on this one. Um, I can see we've got um, uh, three quarters of the attendees have voted. So we uh, so, just, so just to give, another minute. To give me an idea, Alison, how many mm -hmm. how many have we got on the right answer? Um, oh, Ooh. nine. <laughs> Nine, okay. Nine people Fair have enough. got the answer right so far. So we, we've got a decent number. That's all yeah, right. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I wonder I, if those nine people got the first few questions right as well, though. I also wonder whether those nine people have guessed or anyone actually knows, because if mm -hmm. I'm very honest, I didn't have a clue. No, it's, uh, it's no. not easy. I mean, you know, my answer was a lot. I don't know yeah. any more than that. Should, right. I, re should I reveal? Uh, yes, we have. Uh, I'm going to end the polling now. We've come to a standstill, I think. OK, so we had nine people who had the correct answer, which is 123. So if we move on to the next slide, please, Alison. So inhaler devices. Quite a simple split between two different main types, one of which is aerosol and one of which is air dry powder. So known as MDIs and known as DPIs dry powder inhalers, metered dose inhalers. And there's a big difference here between the two, a very simple difference. In one, the patient works the device. In the other, the device works for the patient. So in MDIs, they are pressurized, so the patient has to do very little, i.e. has to do very little work. I'll come back to this in a minute. So we've got MDIs, breath activate, actuated MDIs and soft mist inhalers. With DPIs, the patient has to do all the work. So the patient has to be capable of doing the work to actually make the inhaler work. So we'll come more of that in a minute. But when you think about that 20, 40 percent that we discussed earlier, and if the inhaler technique is not good, then that becomes so low. Someone's just put a question in the uh, about how many inhalers. It's 123, if you didn't all hear. Apologies. And we've got examples of all those. Can we move on to the next slide, please? Thank you. So MDIs, meter dose inhalers, use hydrofluorocarbons as propellant. Not good. These inhalers have a much higher carbon footprint than DPIs. And working with Greater Manchester right now, we are involved in pieces of work to try and reduce the carbon footprint of inhalers. There are too many MDIs prescribed in the UK and across the world, and it has to change. And as I said before, the DPIs don't use any propellant breath activated, actuated, if you want to be technical. Uh, obviously, we with a much lower carbon footprint. And next slide, please. So we've got the devices most frequently prescribed in GM for SABA. We've got MDIs, breath actuated MDIs, turbohalers, acuhalers, and easyhalers. And the next slide again, please. And then those most frequently prescribed for high dose ICS as for SABAs plus, and we've got Elliptor, which is becoming more and more popular. The next Haler, the Spiromax, the Stalpex, and the Four Spiro. And the next slide, please, Alison. So this gives you an idea of the percent prescribed in GM for in the Saba column and then in the high dose ICS column. And you can see those percentages of the MDI 80% in Saba and 80% in ICS. Excuse me. And then looking down at those other numbers, Elliptus seems really popular now, but it's 13%. It's growing, we know that. Turbohaler, in my view, is probably reducing slightly. Accuhaler is going down. Uh, next haler varies per area. And the others, uh, we've got Easy Haler, Stalpex at 9%. I think that's across the two, the way it's described there. So we've got quite a variance of those percentages. Uh, and I know that it's a big variance across each of the areas within Greater Manchester. No one area is the same. Next slide, please. The most important part for me is inhaler technique. 
and the fact that so many patients use their inhalers wrong. So I'm going to try and demonstrate some of the basic inhalers in the MDI category and the DPI category. Uh, it's not, not the easiest thing in the world to do on a screen. Uh, please, if anyone wants any specific inhalers demonstrating, please uh, let us know in the chat and I will make my endeavor to do that for you. So the first one I'm going to do is the basic MDI, which obviously is salbutamol at its uh, most basic, but then obviously moving through all the different drugs that can be uh, delivered to a patient through an MDI. So what do patients do wrong? What patients do wrong is breathing too hard. We all know that. The words we use and we try and instill in professionals and into the patients when using an MDI is gentle and deep. So the inhalation is gentle, but it's going deep. And there are, of course, three processes to using a meter dose inhaler. And that's where people go wrong. They go wrong in the coordination. You see patients so often, and I'm going to try and do it wrong now so you can see, but they put it in the mouth and they start breathing in. Wrong on two counts. They didn't exhale first, but you also need to start breathing in before you press it. So uh, the one thing I haven't mastered is talking to people while I'm actually using an inhaler. It's something I don't think I'll ever master. I'd love to. So if I'm going to talk through it first the, to the patient, to the professional, to yourselves, you exhale. You exhale because if you don't, you haven't made space in your lungs for that drug, that inhaler to go into. You then make a really good seal around the mouthpiece of the inhaler with your lips. You then start breathing in gently. And I always say to patients, just count one, two. And on the two, you press the inhaler and you carry on breathing in gently, but deeply for 10 seconds if the patient can manage it. I always say that five's the minimum, 10's the optimal. During that period, gravity takes over and the inhaler drops down into the lungs and reaches the parts of the lungs where it is really important it does do so. I use an analogy to patients when I talk about starting to breathe and count one, two, and then press it. It's like going in on the crest of a wave. So it, there's a flow going on, you press it and you just carry on breathing and it takes it gently down. So let me just show you not the easiest, so I'm going to breathe out. Nice seal. And that was the 10 seconds. So hopefully you could all see that okay. The next bit I want to show is the use of the same inhaler with an air chamber device. It doesn't matter what the device is, the use is the same. Devices help get the drug deeper and more efficiently into the lungs. And devices negate that problem that occurs with the coordination where you've got to count the one, two, and then press it. And, oh, did I do it right? So personally, I think more and more patients should be using some kind of spacer device. So with the spacer, biggest thing is shake for ah, you're going to tell me off now because I forgot to say shake before using the MDI first. Shake the inhaler into the spacer, one dose, never two, even if the patient takes two doses. When using it without the chamber, you always repeat after 30 seconds, the same with the chamber. Dose can't disappear because there's a safety valve. Breathe out first, as in with the first technique and then breathe gently in, tidal breathing. A tide goes in and out, so it's in and out breathing for around five times. So I did that purposely. If the patient hears that noise or makes that noise, they are doing it too hard. It has to be gentle.
and do that five times. And this is something that often we have to send a note to the doctor. How often do you see a prescription for an easy breathe inhaler and a spacer? Because the doctors don't actually realise that the easy breathe doesn't work in the spacer, etc. Simple things to help patients become more efficient with their inhaler. I'm not going to go through all the devices, but volumatic, very common. Air chambers with masks, and there are now about six different ones. And there are lots of other makes on the market like Able and others. Let me go to the Ellipta. And I know there's a, there's a actually, I won't because there's a film coming up for the Ellipta shortly. Turbo Haler. What do people do wrong? So, what have you got to do with the Turbo Haler? You've got to charge it. So, you turn that. And I've purposely done it wrong because you see lots of patients doing it wrong, has to be held upright. The drug has to drop into the chamber to be able to use. The other thing people do is they hold it wrong. So they hold it and they cover air holes with their fingers. And it happens with lots of different inhalers. So for me, if you hold it like that, you are not impeding, you're not getting in the way, you're not blocking anything. So you've charged it, you're exhaling. <sighs> You're making a good seal around the mouthpiece of your lips and you are inhaling forcefully and deeply as opposed to gently and deeply. So if I do it gently, absolutely nothing will happen. No drug will get. If I do it forcefully, and keep holding my breath, that is the way to work it. Some of the inhalers, you can actually hear the noises of the powder. With, with the uh, hand inhaler, you actually hear the noise of the powder rattling inside the capsule when you use it. And I think it's a great one to demonstrate for that reason. Easy inhaler is getting more popular. Uh, it's done in, I don't even know how many different uh, drugs are in it now, but you saw the pictures before of them. Counter on the side, I'm, I'm sure, oh, maybe you can see it. Uh, quite a few of these DPIs have got counters now. Some MDIs have. Uh, and again, you press that to charge it. That's charged. You have got a mouthpiece to make that seal over. You exhale before use and you breathe in forcefully and deeply. I'm not going to show any more. If people want any more showing, I'm quite happy for that. I did just see a chat from someone saying all steroid from Sunil, all steroid MDI inhalers should be used with an air ch chamber. Absolutely not going to argue with that. Uh, it helps reduce the uh, thrush because what, that's one of the major side effects. And I often recommend to GPs to provide one of these chambers for that reason. You talk to patients uh, about the incidence of thrush and when they're using it wrong. And then when patients return and speak to you again, the thrush or that husky voice, side effects have gone. There's always also the rinsing aspects of the mouth after using any steroid inhaler. Excuse me, inhaler. Uh, Alison, what's the next slide? Or am I on to the... Inject device. You do have a couple. You do have a question in the in the Q and A, Peter, that you might be able to answer now because I think it's probably um, appropriate to answer it right now. From, from Gainer, it says I recently read that it's important to tell a patient to tilt the chin slightly upwards to enable the drug to make a better disposition to the lungs during inhaler use. Is this true? Well, the certainly true that you don't do that. See, so you, you if you have you, your head anything but at a perfect straight i was going to say right angle but that's not right uh or down if it's down it's wrong because it's blocking airways the tilting i hear various stories about that because sometimes some people find it quite uh uncomfortable to tilt much certainly be straight be slightly tilted and if you think about the logic it is opening the airways to allow the drug to pass down into the lungs so it does make sense 
Sorry, we've got a couple of other I've bits. I've seen that, the soft yeah. mist. Yeah, uh, and it'd be a lot of respimat if you've got that. I don't know if you've got the devices to hand. Uh, I've got, I've got, Peter's just rooting through his array. Yeah, I am. No you know, do you know table. what? I haven't actually grabbed a recipe mat. Now, if I have got a, st a stock of stuff uh, in the cellar, which is actually quite close, so I can say twiddle your thumbs and talk amongst yourselves and I'll go see if I've got one. Uh, shall, we, shall we show the Elliptor video then while you go and look for... For a recipe, Matt. Well, I'm, I'm not promising I've got because I'm surprised I haven't pulled one out here. But I, I, you show the video, I'll go and uh, have a look. Thank you. Okay, okay. Bear with me while I share the screen again. Okay, so I think Peter went through those key points for the uh, MDIs. Um, shape before use, gentle deep, de deep breath in and wait at least 30 seconds before taking another puff. Um, as mentioned, we would encourage the use of a spacer and as Sunil said, definitely for uh, steroid MDIs. And it's important to uh, wash monthly with warm soapy water and leave it to drip dry, no towels. Um, spacers should be replaced at least every 12 months. Oh, Alison, sorry, we can't see the slides. So Any not? Apologies. I can't, I can't see the slides. I, I don't know if anybody else is, is the same. Sorry. How's that? That's better. Thank you. So I've just talked through that information without you seeing the slides. Apologies. Thank you, Lou. Uh, in terms of DPI technique, um, Peter's talked through this as well, um, but we've just got a video to show you on the elliptor inhaler. So hopefully this link works. And Lou, can you see that screen? I can. Thank you. I can, yes, thanks. Super, thank you. Hi, I'm Sonia, a respiratory physiotherapist. I'm going to show you how to use the elliptor inhaler. This is a dry powder device or a DPI. Getting an inhaler technique right is very important because it helps you manage your symptoms better. It may take a few tries to feel comfortable using your inhaler, but it does get easier with practice. To use your inhaler, firstly check the dose counter to make sure the inhaler isn't empty. Then slide the cover open with your thumb until it clicks. Check there's nothing inside the mouthpiece. Hold the inhaler horizontally but don't tip it upside down as the powder may fall out. Sit or stand up straight and slightly tilt your chin up as this helps the medicine reach your lungs. The next steps all happen smoothly in one action. Breathe out gently and slowly away from the inhaler until your lungs feel empty and you feel ready to breathe in. Put your lips around the mouthpiece to make a tight seal, making sure you don't cover the vent. Then breathe in quickly and deeply. Take the inhaler out of your mouth and hold your breath for up to 10 seconds or for as long as you comfortably can. Then breathe out gently away from your inhaler. When you've finished, close the cover. If you've used an inhaler that contains steroids, rinse your mouth with water and spit it out to reduce any chance of side effects. For more tips on using your inhaler, why not watch our other videos? I'm going to come in there while we're just listening to a watching a video and being told to look, to look at other videos, just to remind people that we have made videos of how to use every inhaler device in the market. And I said that with a smile because I'm sure something new's arrived since we last did it, refreshed it. But we're pretty confident we've got all the devices in the market. It's a complicated URL, but if you simply Google Greater Manchester Inhaler Technique, it is the first hit on Google. The great to show patients, so I give patients the, the address, and they're, they're very useful for yourselves. So they were made some years ago, but they were made in all different settings from the community pharmacy to doctor's surgeries, uh, in outpatients, inpatients, hospital, to try and show patients that this is a normal way of life. Uh, I have found one. Look what I found in my cellar. So, if I can't remember who asked us to demonstrate the uh, 
recipe mat. It doesn't matter which one it is. They're, I'm pretty sure they're all exactly the same. Uh, Mohammed asked that one. The hardest thing with the recipe mat is actually loading the canister into it. And that's where patients really struggle. Some patients will need it doing by the pharmacy, pharmacy staff. So it's worth asking patients if they are okay loading the canister. Uh, I can't, I tried to get this canister out of this one and I couldn't to show you, but those of you that have done it, it takes quite a bash on a solid surface to get the canister into the inhaler. So that is it. There's a cap there, mouthpiece here. You twist it and it charges. And then there is a gray button that you can see in front of you now. And when I press it, you will see the mist. So that is the easiest inhaler to use on the market because so little effort needs to be done in the breathing in of it. So for patients, that have COPD, and I'm going to talk about this when I'm talking about the incheck. But I've seen patients given the hand inhaler. So the hand inhaler is one method of giving that drug, and this is the another method of giving the drug. This is one of the hardest devices to use. Someone with bad COPD has not got, and I'm going to be very non-technical here, but I like the expression, has not got the power of puff to be able to use this kind and often other DPI devices. This is great for that. So we are seeing more inhalers, sorry, more drugs come out in this device. I hope that helps the people that asked me to show the soft mist and that was uh, useful to you. I'm going to now show you the InCheck device, which I think is, one of the most useful devices on the market. I also think hand in hand with the ACT and CAT test, it helps us, the professional, tell the patient and possibly their GP how well the person's asthma or COPD is controlled. Uh, I said it with a bit of hesitation and the reason is COVID, but we'll talk about that and the problems with using this device in our COVID times. So just for now, forget about COVID. Those of you that know, have used these, I, I, when I do inhaler technique, I use them every single time. There is a new, I'm gonna say iteration, a, a new replacement device. So at the top, I'll take that out. At the top, you'll see various colors around it. You turn it, to designate which inhaler type you are using. With the in-check comes this card, and that shows you which inhaler device the color indicates. And as you change that dial, it changes the resistance of the computer, hence making it easier or harder, depending on whether a patient is using an MDI, a soft mist inhaler, or a DPI. And if you look at the resistance of, the, I don't know how clear that is for you now, but what I can tell you is this demonstrates that the, P, the MDI is the, by far the easiest, followed by breeze inhaler, acuhaler, disc inhaler, lower resistance. The hardest, i.e. the highest resistance inhalers are hand inhaler, I was just talking about that before. The easy inhaler, the whole range, then next inhaler, twist, turbo, etc. So just to demonstrate, I've got this now put onto MDI. So obviously that the mouthpiece is disposable. They're not expensive. They come in boxes, I think, of 30 or 25. Uh, Make sure before they use it that the red disc is at the bottom. Hold it like this, and the patient simply breathes in as though are they are breathing in the, their inhaler. And I'm hoping that most of you know what goes wrong. So what everyone does when they first do this is this. And all I've done is taken it straight off the scale 
which shows I'm used it far too hard. And what will happen to that inhaler? It will hit the back of the throat of me or the patient. And how much of that 20 to 40% that we talked about before will get to the lungs, probably one or 2% if we're lucky, i.e. that is totally wrong. So on the scale of 0 to 120, I'd normally do this as a quiz if I'm doing a face-to-face -face, uh, demonstration. Uh, the number you want to get for an MDI is between 30 and 60. And believe it or not, it's very hard to demonstrate, but hopefully you can hear how gentle. Very, very gentle. If I now turn it to the hardest one, and breathe in gently. <laughs> Nothing at all. And you can hear me cough at the effort. If I do it properly, and that was a really tough breathe in then, heavy power of puff, and I've got to 40, which is actually fine. Big question now is what do we do with COVID? So we have discussed this with the manufacturers, Clement Clark. They have, they won't make an official statement because obviously that would put them at risk. We have got quite a detailed document that is available on the CHL and the LPC websites. You can clean it. So the, when you tell patients how to clean air chambers, you say wash in lukewarm soapy water, carefully rinse and then place to dry on a tea towel or something like that. Do not physically dry it yourself because you can damage it. It's pretty similar to this, although the instructions say wash for longer. So I think I think I read it the other day, it said two or three minutes, rinse it and then obviously let it dry. You'd have to, you'd have to invert it to let the water run out of it. We have to make a personal decision, and I think that is up to the management of the pharmacies, the chains, the multiples, the, the independents, on when you feel you would be happy using one, having used it, washed it and dried it. I personally think that you probably wouldn't, certainly wouldn't redo it in, in a day. Now, but that's my personal opinion right now, and again, we can't give the, that kind of advice to you because one has to be very careful with the COVID. Uh, I hope that helped. It's a difficult one to discuss. But obviously, we are in a different world. Demonstrating inhalers is really hard. I have done a few. Uh, in a decent size uh, consulting room, it's not too bad. In a very small one, it is difficult. Uh, you could consider, could I stand at the door with the door open? Not exactly what I want to do, but we're blowing in things, we're sucking in things, there's air being blown around. The good thing about these is they're disposable and they are one-way valves. So there really shouldn't be uh, fluid going into the uh, inject device. <coughs> I hope that helps throw any questions at us if you'd like about that and can I oh, ask Alison to put the slides on can I mention a few points before I just forget them I've jotted some notes down before we've not mentioned children no one's mentioned children how often do people do or did you do MURs or when you did take part in the uh, earlier iterations of this project do it for children really important we absolutely could do MER to children MERs have gone now but we can do this project we can do inhaler technique on children as long as it satisfies the usual things that parents are with them and they understand what's going on I've done it very successfully with kids it works please think about that the point Alison made earlier about the act and cat scores and the five pound Brucey bonus being paid if you get an increase in actual CAT score on the second visit. I personally analysed about 100 patients that I'd put through this project some years ago. And interestingly, 80% had 
an improvement increase in ACT or CAT score. So hopefully that will give you some indication of what you should be aiming for or looking at. <coughs> One of the questions uh, on farm outcomes when you're first recruiting patients is have you got a asthma management plan in place? I know that when I ask patients that question, they look at me like I've got three heads. Like, what is he talking about? So what we have got is we have got asthma and COPD management plans. That's an asthma management plan. <coughs> Sorry, it's not, it's the COPD, said he. And that is a booklet about COPD to give to the patient. There is a detailed uh, desk stander on COPD for the pharmacy. These are all available from Teva, free of charge, any quantity, asthma and uh, COPD, in addition to the MEMS guide on respiratory devices. So this is a brilliant uh, guide that lists every device. It discusses them, it says how, how they use, how they come. Again, available from Teva. So if people are interested in those, said he looking for the card the gm rep who does not mind you pestering her because i can see 100 emails from tonight is charlotte fletcher some might know her some may not charlotte's email address is charlotte.fletcher at teva uk so it's t-e-v-a uk in one word dot com charlotte knows that i'm going to be telling you all about uh, her helpful uh, products. Uh, please use them. They, I find them fantastic. Peter, we've just had a question. Um, uh, you mentioned children. From what age, please, would you recommend? I know I it's a difficult one. No, I'm smiling because I knew that was going to come up. So I've done as, as young as five and six. So in, in my view, and if you look at, I'm going to say guidance, but if you look at society guidance and PSNC, as long as that child understands what you are doing and what the questions are, and as long as uh, the parent is happy, I think that's fine. So I have successfully done this quite young. And just as you've asked the question, it reminded me of something else. So what do we do when we're using let me pick it when we're using one of these and we've got an infant and we've got let's just say we've got a nine month old baby in a pram with a very concerned mum doctor has absolutely not diagnosed asthma because they never do at that age but the that kid has got a continual uh, cough or has got some difficulty with breathing and the doctor has said on the whole try a salbutamol and they give them this device and they come in the pharmacy and I go, do you know how to use it? And the parent goes, no, would you like me to show you? Please. So how do you get a nine month old baby to do what I described before that tidal breathing five in and out, impossible. So what I personally do, and I'm more than happy to get suggestions from others of what to do, I set it up, I put a dose in, I put the mask over the baby's uh, nose and mouth, and I actually tickle the throat around here. And by tickling them, it makes them breathe. And you will see, because this is our orange, there's a, there's a little orange disc that if you can see, just behind the, the uh, mask, that will actually move in and out. And that, even if it's a couple of times, you know they've got some drug in. It's not gonna be perfect, but it is really helpful. Glad I thought about that to mention. Alison, I just need to know whether I'm back on slides or not. I will share the screen for you now, Peter. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. So I hope that I have done that. I've done DPI. Next slide on, please. Placebos. Okay, yeah, really important. So placebo devices are available from all the manufacturers of inhaler devices, whatever they are. You can get them from 
direct from reps sometimes. Most of them now have something where you can go onto the website and I'm thinking GSK definitely, and you can order as a health professional placebos of their devices. And I also think that we have uh, a lot of contacts within CHL and the LPCs of all the current GM pharma, respiratory pharma drug reps. So if any of you have difficulties getting anything, please ask us to help. With the in-check, obviously you have to buy it unless you're one of those five lucky winners tonight. Uh, the mouthpieces, they are available from AAH, they are available from Alliance. I haven't checked the others, uh, but they're easily available. So I've covered the second bullet point there. The videos I've already mentioned. Uh, oh, there you go. There's a spreadsheet with details of what to order from who. So it's on it's on the LPCs and CHL website. Uh, I think the last bullet point there is so important. And that was on before COVID. How important is it nowadays to clean down good hygiene? Demonstrate that you using good hygiene to that patient. So the patient is coming in to see you to show you must demonstrate good hygiene as well. And the more you practice, the better you get. I mean, and it's interesting that I was asked to demonstrate the soft mist because I can remember going back over the years being not frightened, but being wary of showing people it because it's quite a hard one to show. And the next slide, please. In check, I have covered all of this. Uh, I do, I've got to say the pictorial of the dial on the, uh, it's my right hand side of the screen is, is superb and really useful. And you do get one in every box when you buy that. So it's really useful just for us to understand what we're describing to patients and for us, our own understanding. The next slide, please. Aha, last question. So question five, one hundred, I, I can't read the question now, Alison. <laughs> You've blocked it with the answers. I know, I basically know it. A hundred doses of an MDI have a carbon footprint equally to a, uh, roughly equal to driving how many miles? So we've got six and we've got 180 and everything in between. I've just seen the question at the top, obviously. So, uh, Alison, will you just do the uh, racing commentary, please? I will, yes, thank you. So uh, lowest answer would be six miles. Um, highest answer would be 204. So um, 100 doses have a carbon footprint equal to a drive of how many miles? This is just in an average family car. So we're not, we're not uh, driving anywhere in Peter's sports car, yeah. unfortunately. Uh, Alison, my screen's <laughs> only showing, thanks, thanks. Uh, my screen's only showing 180 at the bottom. Is that it? Uh, there, there is another one underneath. There's a 204 underneath. Right, okay. You, you can so, scroll up and down, Peter. You can scroll up. Okay, thanks. Down. Thank yeah. you. Well, nobody so, has actually answered 204, so maybe nobody else can see that either. Maybe you need to scroll down a little bit, guys, if you think it might be 204. Um, so go on, give me where we've got so far. So the uh, winner so far is 180. We've got 14 people who've given that answer, and the rest varies between 6 and 156. So we've uh, got three, three quarters, two thirds of, of people have voted. So we'll just give you another minute or two just to put your answers on there. So majority seem to be going with 180 miles, but we do have somebody who's answered every other apart from <laughs> 204. So I think you've, you've put people off that 204 one, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just know I couldn't see it. So it's... Uh... I remember that for next time we're doing a poll not to pick the last option because it falls off the bottom of people's screens. So we're still, so, 180 is still the winner so far. We've okay, and uh, what, what kind of numbers have voted? Um, and we are 78 percent right so well I, I'm, I'm happy with that because I don't think we're going to get much higher okay. and just to let you know that that majority number is uh, are correct the answer is 180 miles so when I was talking earlier about carbon footprints and about how uh, concerned the partnership in Greater Manchester as everyone else is about the carbon footprint and about how we can become greener there is a lot of work going on with inhalers. I know that some practices 
uh, in some PCN areas are actually looking at moving away from MGIs to DPIs. You can't do it all the time. And the only other comment I'll make on that is you mustn't do it to the detriment of the patient. Some patients won't want to, some patients won't be able to use the, MD, the DPIs. But, you know, we need to start moving over, but we need to start moving over thoughtfully, carefully, and always putting the patient first. So next slide, please. I think I've just said a lot of this. Uh, three and a half percent. I mean, I don't know how much 798 k kilotons means, but three and a half percent is 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 a lot to me. Uh, of the NHS total carbon emissions are from MDI inhalers. That's scary. That really is scary. And then the, that figure of 70 percent of all inhalers dispensed in the UK are high carbon inhalers. Equally scary. And I'm not going to go through the uh, detail there, but the propellant gases are actually greenhouse gases and the potent. Uh, and just just look at the rest of Europe. Why are we so bad? Why are we so far behind? MDI is less than 50% prescribed. Scandinavia, 10 to 30%. They're always, I hate to say it, better than us in that kind of respect. And we're 70. And it does actually make you sit back and think that, you know, here we are behind in the electric cars and everything else. We do need to I was going to use the wrong expression. We do need to make changes and we do need to help them. So I know that Alison and I have actually been invited to a meeting today uh, on just this Greater Manchester. So we will be attending and we will certainly let it be letting you know through your LPCs uh, and CHL what is going on, what we can do. And there might be some initiatives across PCN networks across Greater Manchester that we can help and start to make a difference. And I think working within PCNs is actually quite a big opportunity. Next slide, please. To delivery support. That's and, uh, and over to Louise. Yes. Yeah, th thank you. Thanks, Peter. Um, so good evening, everybody. Um, on to the, the final session now and um, and the shorty session as well. So um, hopefully we won't keep you too much longer and you'll be able to, to get off and, and hopefully have your evening meals. Um, so I'm going to talk through some of the, the key areas of service delivery. Can I have the next slide, please, Alison? Thank you. Um, and the key performance indicators tonight. So, so to ensure that we deliver in a consistent standard of, of service and we can demonstrate some, some outcomes to our patients and to GPs and to the commissions of the service, each pharmacy is going to be monitored against or measured against a set of key performance indicators. So the first one is that we, we want you to deliver the minimum of one consultation per month. And we are anticipating that you'll deliver more. I'm sure we've all got lots of patients that we can think of that benefit from the service. But we will be looking, um, looking at the data and expecting to see some activity from you every month. Um, the, the other uh, KPIs are that you'll follow up with patients where it's cl clinically appropriate to do so and have that second consultation. And, and if you don't do that, you'll document the reasons why, why it's not been done. But you'll record the, the CAT or the app score for every consultation that you do. And that finally, all um, patients who report that they are a current smoker will be referred on for smoking cessation advice and hopefully for support to quit. Um, and that could be a, a, consult a consultation um, as part of a service that's commissioned by your pharmacy. CHL are going to provide you with some some regular reports and we'll, we'll show, show you the data from the, from the KPIs via a bi-monthly newsletter and, and you do get in touch with us if you've got any questions about the performance management aspects of the service. It is quite new to, to the way we deliver services but it is something that the commissioners want and they want to be able to see to demonstrate what we can do as community farmers to support our patients. Um, so do get in touch with us if you need to about this and um, we'll share our contact details at the end of the presentation. And next slide, please, Alison. Thank you. So having, having covered the KPIs and highlighted earlier, so certainly Alison did, uh, why it's important that we deliver a quality um, service, I'd like to go through some steps we recommend that you, you follow in your pharmacy to make it a success. So the first thing is, is plan and prepare really well. Um, so this includes ensuring that your pharmacist, technicians and pharmacy team are all, are all fully trained, 
they've completed their declarations of competence where it needs to be done, and that you've read all the relevant documentation. Check you've got your equipment in place, that includes your in-check, your mouthpieces and, and placebos, um, and check that you've signed and returned the SLA and returned the banking form um, to CHO. Do have a look as well at the farm outcomes modules and ensure that you're familiar with them. That's an opportunity as well to, to fill in that declaration on farm outcomes and ensure that your, your service is ready and good to go. Um, secondly, get the team ready to deliver. So have a think about how you can link to other pharmacy services and um, things like stop smoking, NMS, potentially if you recommend a device change, um, set some targets to keep on top of those KPIs and, and speak to your local GP so they know that you're providing a service and what value you can add to their patients. Um, and thirdly, ensure you've got a process to follow up your patients who require it and complete the farm outcomes so your payments are processed at the end of each month. And next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so we've developed um, a number of top tips um, to help you think about how you're going to deliver. And these are based really on some of the conversations we've had with pharmacies about, about this service, but about some other services too. Um, so we've looked at the challenges and um, we're going to give you a quick summary now of each of these top tips. But well, please do take them away and really think about how you can use uh, them to add value to, to this service and maybe to some others as well. Um, so looking at, at challenge one, um, my patients say they aren't interested. And this is something that many of us have faced in the past with a variety of, of different services. And it, there's quite a lot of re reasons for this reluctance from patients. Some of it that might be that patients uh, want to get in out of the pharmacy quite quickly that day. They weren't expecting to spend any time with you and they don't feel it's, it's a priority for them at, at that moment. Or they might feel that they get adequate care from their GP practice and they don't need the added expertise of a community pharmacist to manage their condition at that time. But what we do know is that asthma um, shouldn't have an adverse impact on patients' lives. We know that it's, if it's not well controlled, that it does. Um, and we know that poor technique is one of the biggest reasons for poor asthma control. So these two things, can be part of, of early conversations prior to a consultation just to try and engage patients with the service and um, start looking at your SABA use via the PMR system and that could be a good way to to identify some patients who so may be ordering a lot of SABA inhalers um, and, a, and a good conversation starter for you. So really try and sell the benefits of improved inhaler technique leading to some better symptom control and better quality of life for patients explain that this service is, is there to complement what their GP does and it's not a replacement and that the local GPs are aware of the service and the supportive. And finally, think about some of the words that you use when you're speaking to patients or trying to engage them. Some patients prefer to think about things as a, as a chat about their medicines, chat about their inhalers rather than, than a formal service. And next slide, please. Thank you. So moving on to a challenge too, um, I'm too busy to stand at the counter looking for patients. So like Alison said earlier, this is where it's really important to utilise your whole pharmacy team and really take some time now to think about how you can identify some patients. Your counter staff, um, particularly, and as, as well your dispensary staff, are really ideally placed to have some conversations with patients um, who are dropping off or collecting prescriptions. Thinking about Think about using your PMR and, and flag some eligible patients and, and maybe add some notes to prescription bags once they've been dispensed so they aren't missed when they're collected. Make sure you hold a staff briefing and, and, and go through the service with them so that everybody knows and understands which patients are going to be eligible. And finally, um, set yourself some targets to keep on track of your progress. And next slide, please. Challenge three, um, so how can I reach patients who don't collect their own medicines? And this is always gonna be a challenge for us as community pharmacy. A lot of our patients have representatives picking up or we, we deliver the prescriptions. So we don't always see these patients from month to month. But I think it's important to remember that not all patients who don't pick up are housebound and that um, just because they don't routinely collect their prescription, it doesn't mean that they can't get into the pharmacy if you give them a call and explain why you'd like to see them. Um, again, you know, printing some leaflets or some flyers or adding a note to the prescription bag um, for delivery or collection so that patients know about the service would be, a, would be a good thing to do. And like Alison said before, remote consultations could also be an option. So the really key thing is, is to be flexible. Think of all the ways you can communicate with your patients. You can use text, you know, email, phone, 
um, the representatives and even your delivery drivers potentially if you ensure they're properly briefed to just to explain a little bit about it to the patients when they drop off prescriptions. And um, next slide please. Thank you and on to challenge four. How can I balance unpredictable workloads with consultations? So this is why it's important really to plan ahead and at the same time I accept that there's always going to be opportunistic consultations for this service as, as there is with others for things like um, NMS and, and flu and in the past with MURs. We do recommend where possible booking um, some time in and booking some appointments at times when your pharmacies may be less busy or you've got extra staff available. Be flexible, you know, try and ensure you've always got somebody trained and able to provide the service in the pharmacy if it's needed or you identify a patient um, in, in the pharmacy and, and you, can, you can crack on and, and deliver that service. If you're planning to carry out the consultation remotely, um, rather than agreeing a specific time that you're going to phone a patient where you might have, you know, unavoidably been detained doing something else, offer a slot of maybe an hour or two um that you'll contact them in you know sometimes you know they're going to be home and you can make that make that call and arrange that video consult but please if you if you do arrange to do remote consultations don't forget about your patients really important that um you don't we don't leave people sat at home waiting for a call from the pharmacy and, and it doesn't happen um next slide please thank you so challenge five and uh, my patients forget appointments and don't answer the phone and um, so realistically, many patients will need to be reminded to access the service and attend the appointment, especially the follow-ups. We all know there's a, there's a bit of a drop-off with stage services, things like NMS, capturing that, that second and third stage can always be a, a struggle. Um, so, so think about ways that you can remind patients, you know, use some um, written comms um, to them at the first appointment, maybe an appointment card or a print-off from farm outcomes adding a note to the PMR um, when the patient has their first consult. So there's a reminder when you go in um, and, and dispense their next EPS script and, and make, make good use of the technology you've got. So um, remind, remind them um, beforehand with an email or a text. It's really important to have the right contact details for patients. Um, we, we've all got stuff on our PMR that's probably been there for, for quite some time. So always check the details with the patient and don't rely on historic information that might that might be there that might not be accurate. Um, and next slide, please. And on to the last challenge here, um, challenge six, my GPs are just not interested. And this is a really important action for you. Um, GPs may seem not interested in things because they've not really been told or had it explained to them well. So it's gonna be much more successful if you, if you engage the GP practice and explain um, what it is that you're doing and explain that you that, that the GP can refer in into the pharmacy if needed. And that's going to be a real benefit for them for those patients that don't routinely turn up for their asthma reviews. Um, like patients, the GPs need to know that what we're trying to do is to complement their work. We're not trying to replace what they do. So sell the benefits of, of, to, to them of, of how we can support their patients and support them as a practice team. Engage with, with all the, the GP team. So don't just stick with the, with the doctors, um, you know, the practice pharmacist and practice nurses also need to know about this as well as maybe the reception staff. Um, and finally, if, 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 you, if you do get referrals and they start to dwindle or if they are very low, um, you know, don't be afraid to speak to the GPs again, build those relationships and it'll benefit this service and, and others in the future. And on to the next slide, please, Alison. Thank you. Um, so we're moving towards the end of the presentation. Um, now, um, before, um, before I finish, just uh, here's the email address for you, enquiries at cpgmhealthcare.co.uk. And that's the email that you can email any queries into, please. Um, or you can pick up the phone and you can speak to the LPCs or, or to Alison at CHL. Um, right at the end of the webinar, we're going to ask for a little bit of feedback on tonight's section. Um, so there'll be a a link will pop up as you close the, the event after the Q&A. So you can fill it in straight away there and it'll only take a few seconds and we'll also email a link across to you as well. Um, Peter has, has assured me that um, we know we will spam you with emails um, if, if we don't get the feedback, but no, in all seriousness, the feedback is really beneficial because um, it helps us to, to, to think about how we deliver training and what we might want to do in the future. Um, so I'll pass you back to Alison now to pick up any questions that you might have. Thank you. 
Thanks, Lou. Um, just a, a quick review of the answers to the quiz questions that are just on screen now, just uh, to confirm for everybody. And um, we'll go ahead and take any questions. I'm going to stop sharing and then we can get back on screen. Um, I have uh, made a, a few comments for anybody to put any questions that they may have in the chat box or the Q&A box, but I can't see that anything's come through as yet. So now is the time, ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions. Um, we can't use the raised hand function, unfortunately, in, in Zoom, um, just because I have no idea how to unmute people with the raised hand function. So I do apologise. Yeah. This is my... Uh, inexperience with using the Zoom platform. But please do put any questions that you so might have. Alison, will the slides be made available post-webinar is the first question. Yes, we will put the slides on the CHL website and we'll make sure that there's links um, on the LPC websites as well. So we'll, we'll have those slides available for you, no problem. Um, but, it may possibly be uh, early next week before we get that done. And then the next question is, do we need to complete the CPPE training on inhaler technique? So the, there is a new newish e-learning module on inhaler technique um, from CPPE, and that is one of the suggested um, requirements in the declaration of competence for the inhaler technique service. So if you haven't done that, I would definitely suggest that you do that. It gives you a really good uh, background to all the different devices. So if you haven't done that, then yes, please do complete that as part of your declaration of competence. But actually, as Peter said earlier, um, there is no substitute for practicing. So get your hands on those placebo devices. Use the uh, references that we've provided for you. Um, again, on the CHL website, there's a spreadsheet of which inhaler um, is which manufacturer and how you contact them to, to source the placebos. So please do, if you don't have them, order those placebos in um, and have a play with them. Uh, take them home. Uh, make sure that you're familiar. Practice in front of your family. Get your family to demonstrate inhaler technique to you because the more comfortable you are with demonstrating, the better your consultations will be with your patients. And next question from Haroon is, if a consultation has been conducted on a patient, can it be conducted on them again after a long time, for example, a year? It's a really, really good question, Haroon. Go on, Peter, what are your thoughts? Well, on my, my thoughts are we originally used to do this eight to 12 weeks. I think a year is too long, Haroon. Uh, first of all, we are human beings. We all forget things. So I used, to, I used to try and sit down with patients on an annual basis anyway to review their inhaler technique. So for the sake of this project, and I'm looking for agreement from or not from Alison and Louise, I feel it should be in, within an eight to 12 week window. If so we're trying I'm, to help, go on. Yeah, I was just going to add to that. I think for, for an initial consultation, then a follow up, the follow up definitely needs to be between eight and 12 weeks. I'm wondering if the question is more around if I've done a consultation with you, Peter, today, I've done your follow up ah. in eight weeks time. And then you come in 12 months later. Can I then do another initial inhaler technique? Yeah, well, my answer would then be yes, for the reasons I just said about us human beings being forgetful people. That so people... around about 12 months between initial yeah. consultations. I, I, I think so. And, and potentially use of NMS in between if there's any new devices. Yeah, always. I mean, we haven't really mentioned NMS much, but I think that is going to be quite a useful tool for us and yes nms can be done as well as this project there is no reason why not yeah i would definitely agree i think um it's very easy to slip back into bad habits with inhalers it takes a lot of effort from a patient and um, having had their inhaler technique corrected to actually maintain that over a period of time and um, so certainly you know the, the initial and the follow-up is great but you know that routine annual check is really important and there's certainly nothing uh, specific in the service specification around that recall period for patients. So um, if, if you have a, uh, a professional uh, rationale as to why you've, you've uh, repeated a consultation with a patient, as long as you can justify that for a, a professional or clinical reason, then I think it would be very unlikely that you would be challenged. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't challenge it at all. The only thing I would think possibly think about her in there is if, patient comes back after a year i'm hoping their technique would be better than awful you know if it had been the first time round. so therefore the, the, there is always the question of the follow-up being you know clinically justifiable clinically necessary but you know as a professional 
talking to you who's asked the question. It's your judgment. You know, we are all professionals. We are judging how that patient is. If that patient comes back after a year and their asthma or COPD doesn't look like it's well-maintained, acting cat, brilliant, in check next, is there more we need to do? Is there more we need to think about? Does the, is, a, is there a different conversation with that patient's GP? You know, something else to think about. You know, we talk about, you know, with the GPs, it's the addition of a... Of a, a uh, area chamber type device, a spacer. It's the rec possible recommendation of the change of a device. Uh, I indicated the hand inhaler being difficult before, uh, you know, to a device that a patient can use. But is the more, obviously we're not going to uh, recommend change of drugs, but is there a different kind of conversation with a GP, with a practice nurse who's, uh, you know, does all the inhaler asthma uh, COPD reviews so we, uh, just to think about that as well you know it doesn't just stop at that point we need to think I was going to say outside the box we need to think about what all the options are to improve that patient's uh, outlook and outcomes. Thanks Peter um, it might just be worth um, flagging one of the questions that we had earlier during the presentation, which is around um, the act and cat score. So, um, Louise, I think there's a question about can you partially save something in farm outcomes and then come I, back? To I, yeah, I, I answered it. I typed an answer before to that. You can't. I think at the moment, partial save is, is a great functionality within 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 farm outcomes, but it's something that the Pinnacle are, are keeping to themselves for the services that they launch nationally. Certainly as, as LPCs and, and CHL setting up services on farm outcomes, we don't have the, the option at this start, at this time to do partial save on, on right, any Right. Can I, can I suggest that we discuss that with Pinnacle? And the reason I'm saying it is that we use it all the time for COVID vaccinations right now. Yeah. So reception staff partially save the initial information and then they come to vaccinators. I'm involved and I see it all the time. So it is a functionality. There is... No reason why not. But what I would say to the per whoever asked the question and to all of you, you can print off Act and Cat. I've got uh, some colour ones that we printed off a long time ago. But you can print, print off black and white versions. Uh, the links are on the websites. If counter staff simply get the patient to do that, it is very easy for whoever does the next stage on farm outcomes to input that information from those drop down boxes that Alison indicated earlier. It's also a really good way to, to get patients engaged with the service because yeah. they, they suddenly realise that their, their, their asthma control or COPD control is really quite poor. And that's a, a good way for them to actually want, want you to help them. You do get the odd one who it's absolutely perfect and that's more, a bit more difficult, but um, certainly for those that are, that are, that are getting less than, less than good scores, it's, it's a good in and for the good in for that patient yeah. and what is interesting and I've, i'm sure you've all come across it i've come across act scores of 22 3 4 5 so the good numbers with patients with absolutely awful inhaler technique and if it's 25 it's very difficult to go anywhere but if it's if it is 20 21 22 23 uh i always say let's get you to 25 and have done so, you know, there is room for manoeuvre, but it's, it is a more difficult conversation, as Louise indicates, when a patient has got come out with a good uh, ACT score. I think that might also be another tool that you could use for that patient with the 12 month question that we just had from Haroon yeah. earlier. You could you could use ACT or CAT um, after a 12 month period of time to identify whether another initial inhaler technique consultation would be appropriate looking at the ACT or CAT score. You, you can also think, I suppose, if you've got patients who are on quite high dose steroids, you've got perfect control and um, whether, whether it's an opportunity to recommend to the doctor that they, they could be stepped down um, slightly in, in their treatment because that's always a benefit to the patient. Um, so it certainly, it, it certainly having a perfect score doesn't mean that there doesn't need to be a consultation. No, I mean, yeah. I, I have done this. And if, we, if we're going to talk about, or we can talk about money or we can talk about stepping down. So yes, stepping down from a 250 to a 125, if they're maintained. We can also look at the, the biggest thing is the reduced use of things like salbutamol, because, you know, that is really important. And that's also something that staff can use to pick up on patients, excessive 
ordering youth salbutamol, and we see it. So uh, that's that's also an indicator where we should get involved. Lots of things for staff to look at. <laughs> you know, the helpful hints that Louise was going through before. But you, you will have your own. I'm, I'm not for a minute saying that we've got them all there. Uh, that there will be things that, you know, and actually, if you have got any great hints, throw them at us because we might use them. We might, we might share them with all our colleagues. We, can all, we, we don't stop learning. I think some of the data on overuse of salbutamol inhalers, when I've looked into it, it's actually been quite scary. Um, the, the, you see people who will get a new salbutamol MDI every month, and actually the maximum recommended um, use is two inhalers in a year. So 12 in a year is significantly higher than, than, than what people should be using. Um, so again, that might be another thing that you want to look at in your PMR to try and help identify patients to recruit into the inhaler technique service. Um, if somebody is, is getting an inhaler, salbutamol inhaler prescribed and dispensed every month, there's a suggestion there that there's an issue with their condition. Um, so another reason potentially to recruit them into the service. Okay, I can't see any more questions coming in at the moment. So I'll just give you one last minute to ask any questions that you may have before we close the webinar for this evening. As we mentioned earlier, we will make the slides available. And if we can do the uh, snipping of the recording of this webinar to, uh, to edit out the chit chat at the beginning, then we'll also try and make that available on CHL and LPC websites. Um, I hope that you found it useful this evening. Please do give us some feedback. As Louise mentioned, it's really important. Um, we work really hard to try and deliver uh, quality events and, and, and events that are useful to pharmacists and, and contractors and their teams. Um, so please, if there's anything that you think we could do differently or do better, we're really open and welcome um, that feedback. So please do fill yeah. in. These Can I just add, uh, feed, for me, uh, we've done this for many years for a lot of pharmacists. And I'm hoping there are a lot of the pharmacy team, not just pharmacists online tonight. I'd be really interested in feedback from them because, you know, we, as I said in uh, my response to a question before, this is about whole team delivery. You, you have no idea how hard Alison, Louise and I fought to get that added into the spec of this uh, service. So it's something we've got there now. AMA, I want to make it, demonstrate that we can do it and it is a whole whole team but i'd love feedback just to hear what people feel and do they feel confident now to move forward and actually do it important yeah, absolutely thank you peter lou any final words from you before we close no, no nothing else for me nothing no Fab. well thank you very very much everybody for joining us this evening and um, as i said i hope you found it useful and informative and uh, best of luck with um, delivering this service and recruiting those patients in. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you all.